Well, it's Friday. And as I said last week, I'm going to start issuing on Fridays some of my earlier podcasts that didn't get much exposure because it was a new podcast. But they're too good to miss. My friend Mark Hollenstein is in this one. He's a body worker. He's an energy worker. He's a coach. And this last year, he's become an artist. We're not going to talk too much about that, though. We're going to listen to his personal story. And I have to say, in all of the coming out stories, this is probably the hottest G-rated story that I've had on my podcast. Give a listen. Hey, and while you're at it, hit that uh, subscribe button below, will you? It helps me out. I'd appreciate it. Thanks. <music> Wilkinson here. Today I'm with my friend Mark Hollenstein. Say hi, Mark. Hey, everybody. Hi, Wilkinson. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. Mark has been my energy coach and my friend and my confidant and a whole bunch of things for the last five years since uh, ever since I moved to the desert. We have similar backgrounds. We both were involved in church stuff, church ministry things in our former lives. And uh, Mark, tell us a little about yourself. Just briefly tell us your story. Briefly. So... Time's up. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. My work done. Okay. So when I was 19, I got married to my high school sweetheart. We were raised Catholic. We graduated Catholic high school together. One month out of high school, I had a born again religious experience and converted to fundamental Christianity, got married, went into Bible college for that denomination. We had three kids in four years. So first one at 20, second at 21, third at 24. When I graduated from Bible college, we left with a team of 27 people, started a church in Santa Cruz. Then from there, I helped start seven churches in 10 years as a church planter. And then my wife and I took a team of 17 people from Santa Cruz to Santa Rosa in 1991 to start our own church. And 18 months in, I had a clinical nervous breakdown that came on in the middle of the night. I dropped out of um, ministry, took a sabbatical, never went back. My wife and I went to therapy and took two years to decide we would terminate our marriage and continue to co-parent. I came out as a authentic gay man and uh, started doing massage to make quick money out of, as I was raising my kids since I left the church. And from there, my energy intuitive gifts all kicked in and my ability to help people kicked in and I became a retreat facilitator and life coach and that was 31 years ago. That's as quick as I could do it for you, Wilkinson. Wow. <laughs> what uh, what triggered the uh, the breakdown? Was it that you weren't living your authentic self or what was it? Well, that's a big piece of the story. Um, ultimately, yes. I woke up in the middle of the night, and it was, a, it was a very fascinating, I'll call it a metaphysical experience. I was lying in my bed. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. It was 4.44 in the morning. I woke up. I had been exhausted. I went to bed at midnight. It was a Thursday because I remember coming home from my office studying for my sermon on Sunday. I always did that on Thursday night, a little office outside of my home. I was exhausted and fell asleep, and next thing I knew, I was wide awake. And I had this strange sensation, I am wide awake, and I just went to bed. And I, my eyes were looking straight at the window that was parallel with our bed. There was a full moon that night, and a moonbeam was hitting the window, and it made it look like a television. And on the television screen was a picture of me sitting cross-legged on the floor with my uncle when I was nine years old in my parents' bathroom. That wasn't an unconscious memory, but I had never questioned it. I was in awe that it was projected or seemingly projected on my window at 4.44 in the mo morning. Right. And I asked myself silently in my head, what was I doing in the bathroom with my uncle and it was like I reached over to the window on a pause video and unpaused it and the whole scenario played out I won't go into the gory details but basically my uh, uncle turned around and he 
inserted himself into my mouth and he had a, a climax and I relived the whole thing in my bed with my wife sleeping next to me. It was amazing. It was like I was standing outside of my bed watching myself have this whole experience, but I, I also could feel myself lying in my bed. I could feel the dampness of the, of my wet swimsuit on my body from that time i could smell the chlorine lying in my bed on my body like that time i could hear mm. the kids splashing and playing outside through the open window at the pool party that was happening at that time i could taste everything and i just started sobbing uncontrollably and i scared my wife i woke her up and she was like mark you're scaring me you're gonna wake the kids up you're scaring them what's wrong please stop please stop i could not stop she got me out of bed took me downstairs to our guest room called our best friends who were my assistant pastor and his wife his wife happened to be a therapist she came over and sat with me and i could not stop crying for mm. five hours solid my wife got the kids up, took them to school, did everything she had to do that morning, came back. I was still crying. Wow. I came to find out years later from my friend who was sitting with me right at the moment she was going to call an ambulance and 5150 me. Like she, she sat for five hours. That's a pretty good friend right. and a pretty aware therapist. Like she knew something big was purging. But after five hours, she's like, okay, this is extreme. Like beyond her scope. scope. Yeah. yeah. And... Right when she was going to do that, I stopped crying. I, it was like I had drained the well of sorrow. And so was, this was a repressed memory? Well, so what nobody knew that was going on in my mind for five hours, that memory was a conscious memory I locked in freeze mode. And hidden behind that memory was sexual abuse I endured by two female housekeepers that my parents had employed from the time I was six to the time I was 11. All wow. of that was in my unconscious memory. And all of that came flooding out that night. And in the morning, I was completely exhausted and I crawled into bed and I literally could not get out of bed for six weeks. I had to quit my job at Macy's. I was working a full-time job as a men's manager. I left the church. My assistant, uh, my assistant pastor took over. And one morning after about six weeks, I was hardly eating. I just could not get out of bed. I felt different. I just woke up and I said, something's different. I had a little bit of strength, just a little, not hope but a little bit of strength. And I thought, I got to use this strength. And I got on the phone and I called one of the therapists that my friend had referred six weeks earlier, but I just didn't have the ability. Got into therapy, working with the therapist, we pieced it all together. Because it was of such a sexual nature, I had to put my true sexuality on the table with him. I knew that if I was going to heal, I knew I had to be honest with him. And So um, that was telling him that you were gay. Yes. And that was another remarkable experience. As I look back, as all the pieces fit together, the first day I went in to tell him what happened after I told him about crying for five hours, <laughs> I said, and I feel like I need to tell you, I'm attracted to men. That's how we said it when in the church back then. Right. <laughs> you couldn't say you were gay. Same you were sex attraction. <laughs> right. Right. And, um, and I shared something with him around that. I don't remember what it was, but he looked at me square in the eyes. This was a Christian pastor in the same, I mean, a Christian therapist in the same denomination as mm -hmm. us in full-time practice. That's right. the only kind of therapist I would go to was a Christian one, right? <laughs> And he looked at me square in the eyes and he said, Mark, you're gay. God made you that way. And there's nothing wrong with you. Wow. I stood up. Uh, it, it, it was like this knee jerk reaction. I did not expect that. I literally <laughs> stood up and I looked at him and, and I said, as rough as I thought I could <laughs> say it, that is heresy. And I'm never coming back here. And I dramatically, like a flamboyant gay man, <laughs> slammed the door. <laughs> and Which just proves you're a queen then. Right? <laughs> and okay. I ran to my car and I shut the door and I started sobbing again. And again. as I was sobbing, I thought, oh my God, I'm here we go again. But I, those tears were of such relief that somebody said, what I was hoping somebody would say to me all those years. And mm. secretly, I could not wait to get back the next week. He knew dang well I was coming back, and I did. And I stayed with him for three years. And two of those years were with my wife and he and I. The word we would use now would be 
designing a plan to consciously uncouple. Right. Like we really, we divorced the best way Christians possibly could set that up. Okay. Um, you just stopped pastoring the church, period, like cold turkey. Yeah. I said I was on sabbatical and then I would figure out what was going on and then figure out how to come back. But once we, once I put my gay cards on the table, I couldn't go back. Right. And, um, once you're at the point of no return at that point. (laughs) And, and my assistant pastor, like they were our best friends and they were like, what? They didn't know what to do with that. And he's, you know, he gladly took over the church. It didn't last much longer because it wasn't his passion. He was just an assistant, but so at one point, did you say that to your wife? Did you tell her what that you were gay? Oh, that's a whole nother story. Um, two years into our marriage, while I was still in Bible college, we were sent to a pastor's retreat. I don't know why we were there. We were the youngest ones there and I wasn't in ministry yet. I was still in Bible college, hmm. but we went and every, the, the theme of this was retreat was sex in ministry and how to keep sex alive in your ministry when you, you know, you're, you're, there's so many demands on you as a pastor, right? and a pastor's wife. So you go to these workshops and it was all about sex. And then you go back to your hotel room and have sex. And that was <laughs> way too much sex for me. Um, right. And so on that retreat, I told so you realized your heart wasn't in that. What? In the sex. I mean, that's uh, like... she realized that we both realized it on the honeymoon, <laughs> believe me, wow. two years earlier. But I told her on that retreat and she was amazing. She looked me in the eye. She cut my hand. Well, you my... told her you were gay at that point? Mm-hmm. She Two cut years into, into the marriage at okay. this pastor's retreat. She's cupping my hands with her face. She's looking me in the eyes and she said, I love you. It's okay. We're going to figure this out. And then she took my ass to the, um, <laughs> the senior pastor at that thing. And they prayed for me and prayed over me, cast demons out. And a whole new level of drama was so added they to want. So the idea was pray, pray away the gay. Mm -hmm. Wow. It was more intense than that. It was pray away the demons that are making you gay. And you believed that at the point at the time? I was willing to believe anything to get rid of it because it was so taboo and unacceptable back then. But I knew, I knew it wasn't, I, I, I knew the truth. Nope. This is how I made because even well, I should back up. So that's what happened. And we chose to stay married another 15 years. There was a lot more drama. That was prior to me starting the church, prior to me graduating high school, right. prior to me going out and helping start a church. So we did try to make it work for another 15 years. And I just stuffed it. I found some relief that she knew that I was attracted to right. men, that men that did bring some relief in the lack of sex in our marriage. It didn't bring her any, um, it robbed her of what she deserved, but at least she had some understanding and she wasn't quite taking it so personally, but eventually it was slowly killing her. From the point you met with a therapist that, that said you're gay and it's okay. You, then you were going into your exit strategy with her. How long did that take that period? Well, the first year we were not um, planning to divorce. The first year we committed to how, what do we do with this? And what do we do with the fact that I'm not a pastor anymore? Like, how, now, what, what's our life about? Now, was she a pastor as well? She wasn't. Um, no, Officially? She, no. Okay. But, you know, in, in our denomination, you she's a pastor. She had some responsibilities. Right. But so at some point, I don't know, somewhere in the first year, we said, you know what, maybe... Oh no, there's, <laughs> there's another piece of the story. Do you, you want the, oh, the, of course. Okay. So at that time, what I was doing, I had always been into fitness and I was a certified aerobic instructor and personal trainer. So I went back to that. That's what I did. I went back to that. Because to, you weren't pastoring and you didn't have a job. And I needed money. Exactly. Right. And so I went, we were living in Santa Cruz and I went to a, a fitness conference in San Jose. And I think it was Friday to Sunday and I got there Friday afternoon and I checked into the hotel and I was (laughs) walking toward the conference center and I'm walking on one side of the street and on the other side, it wasn't a big street. You could see people across the street is walking toward me. Is this I'm six, three and this guy must have been six, six. And he was a blonde hair, blue eyed, mustached Adonis. I'm telling you, boys, girls, 
rocks and birds were all staring at him on both sides of the street. <laughs> Everybody was staring at him. He was stunning. And I'm looking at him. I'm walking and I'm watching him pass. And then I look over my shoulder and I thought, okay, well, there he goes. And I look and he's crossing the street behind me. And I keep walking my direction and I look over my shoulder and he's walking faster. I'm like, is he coming over so here? So he changed directions. Then, right? Yeah. And, and crossed the street. And crossed the street. Right. Now he's walking in my direction behind me. And he passes me and he looks at me. Now, I have been closeted my entire life and I didn't know how to play that game, but I knew he was looking at me. Right. And he passed me, looks at me, and then he keeps walking just about a half a block and he goes into this restaurant. I don't know why, but like a magnet, I followed him. You felt and, hungry all of a sudden. Uh, well, I actually <laughs> really was hungry and I was planning on eating. Right. Okay. And like a magnet, I just fall, fall in line behind him. There's three girls at the hostess stand, him and me, and I'm my distance behind him and he's not looking at me. A hostess comes up, says to the f first three, how many in your party? She says three and sh sh that hostess says, follow me. The next hostess walks up to this guy and says, how many in your party? He says, one, unless he, and he turns around, points at me and says, unless he would like to join me. My heart <laughs> jumped into my throat and I could barely get out. Yes. <laughs> uh oh. And I, we had lunch together and then we made plans to, he had, he had, uh, you kind of pre-registered for the topics you wanted to hear and he really wanted to go what he was going to go do. So wait, he was at the same conference. Then. Yeah. Oh, I didn't say that. Yes. Yeah. He's a trainer. Yes. That's, we discovered okay. that at lunch. We're both going to this conference. Thank you. Yes. Okay. He, he's a trainer also. I think he lived in San Diego and I was in, um, San Francisco and this was in San Jose. So we're both not in our own towns, right? I'm married. So he, um, <laughs> so he says, let's go to our things and then let's meet up at the big dance tonight. They kick off the party with a big dance that was, um, sponsored by Nike. And this is like early eighties, like aerobics and fitness. It's the rage, right? So this place is, is that bad. like the Jane Fonda? Yeah. All of days that, back all then? of that, okay, all, right. all of okay. that. And I taught me and my twin sister taught at one of the biggest aerobic clubs in Southern California. It was called the racquetball world. So. So it's nighttime and it's time to meet him. And I'm like pacing outside the, the doors to get into the ballroom, right? Finally, it's apparent he's not here. He's not meeting me. I, I walked up every aisle, looked at every table and then stood outside where you had to enter. Didn't see him, wasn't there. Okay, just as well. I'm married. Like, I don't know what I think is going to happen, but I was, I was looking for him. So I go in, I find a table that has an open seat. I introduce myself. We sit down, we all eat. Nice chit chat, really friendly, enthusiastic fitness people, right? right. And then they, the DJ starts the music and it was like this wave of energy. Everybody got up and zoomed to the dance floor. It was probably some super popular song. I don't remember what it was, but I remember everybody like the surge of energy, myself included. And we just went to the dance floor. We were not on the dance floor five minutes and an explosion happens and sparks are flying everywhere. Um, some circuit blew and it caught everything on fire like drapes and like big crushed velvet drapes. It just went whoosh, and everybody yells and screams and then runs out. Right. And they're trying to get everybody out all safely. And they, and, and they had no idea that it was God sending a lightning bolt to you. Right. But well, <laughs> clearly you got that memo. I still hadn't got that, but so that party is over. It's over now. And I'm disappointed, right? I was going to have a good time. And I go back to my hotel room, which was like right across the street. And I get in my hotel room and this was old school, you know, the red light on your room phone, it's blinking. Right. And I'm like, oh, I forgot to call my wife and talk, tell her I got here, right? I pick up the phone and it's, a, it's voicemail and it's him. I didn't tell him where I was. He's like, hey, uh, you gave me your card. I checked to see if you were in my hotel. You are. I'm upstairs in room, blah, blah, blah. I didn't go to the party. It's not my thing, but I'd love to see you. I'm having dinner. Come on up when you get here. I'm like, what? So I am wiping my pits and brushing my teeth and I could not get in that elevator. And my heart is pounding. I don't know what I'm thinking is going to happen. And I get to his door and I knock on the door <laughs> and he opens the door and all he's wearing is this really plush white robe that's open down to his pelvis 
you know, tie with the tie, yeah, with his big uh, pecs, pecs showing, fuzzy yeah. and tan is all get out. So all I see is tan, white robe, <laughs> white teeth, and literally my knees go weak. And I'm looking like a babbling in <laughs> like, 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 like oh I was so out of my element back then. And he invites me in and he has a table set up with room service, all elegant and no food eaten. I'm like, how did you know that party was going to end? And I would be like, he timed it perfectly. Like this meal just got delivered and he's got a meal for two. Yes. And I'm like, I'm I, and le- legit. I'm like, I just ate. I'm not hungry, but I'll sit here with you. And maybe by the time it's time for dessert, I'll have one of those piece of cake or whatever it was. And he so said, trainers ate cake back then. Well, there was dessert. I just remember <laughs> that. Maybe it was healthier than cake. I don't right. know. Um, but he posi- so we're across this little table, and there's there's no drape like you see in the hotel um, movies. You just, I could see under the table and he just opens his legs purposefully. And I'm just like, oh, I'm in trouble. I am, I had never been with another man like that. I had had a few youthful things, but this is the first time. And he invited me to spend the night with him. And, um, wow. I, all I could see in my mind's eye was my wife's face flashing like neon, neon, Lena, Lena, Lena. And I'm like, ah, and then I had this thought and this is, this is the absolute truth. I had this thought. You've never been with a man like this, Mark. You've had a few little youthful play things, but you're planning on leaving your wife and your children and you've left your ministry. Maybe you should make sure that this is what you want. So if you're going to buy a Corvette, you want to take it for a test drive. Kind of, right? <laughs> right? Okay. And 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 it's the top top of the line, <laughs> top model. You should see if this fits, right? We get in bed and I, I am feeling so guilty and so out of my element. I cannot perform. And he could not be any more kind and supportive and not mm. demanding and just so sensitive to what I was going through. So did he know your position in life at that point? Well, because we had lunch. So we had talked at lunch. So, so he knew that. Yes. He and knew. he invited you up in anyway, spite of that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I don't remember everything that I shared, but pretty much I know I shared you know, the, the, the gist of it. He got, the he got gist, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there were two beds and he said, I would love for you to spend the night in here with me. We're both two tall guys. Why don't you sleep in that bed? I'll sleep in this bed and maybe we can have breakfast together. I'm like, okay, I can do that. He gets in bed. He's like, I, I should say in that experience, he did pleasure himself and had an orgasm. We have that conversation, get in separate beds. He's, he was a total man. <laughs> By the time he, <laughs> and I was awake the all entire night, night, yeah. just like, okay, now Mark, this is big. What are you going to do with this? Eventually I fall asleep and I wake up to this body getting in the bed behind me, spooning me and these little tiny kisses on my neck. And my body responded in absolute arousal. And I'm like, this is me. This is, mm-hmm. this is me. And I, I never, that feeling was like, I was touched at the deepest place of my longing and my mind and my body and my emotions, they all clicked in and said, yeah, this is your reality. I don't think we did anything. I know we didn't, um, have penetrative sex. I may have, um, we both may have had a, an orgasm. I don't, I really don't remember that part. I just remember the kisses and the snuggle and my body responding and right. making a decision that day for myself. It's time for my marriage to end. Ironically, we, I got home on a Monday therapy with my wife was Tuesday. She got there before me. I walk in the room, I sit down and she's like, before he could, he could even start the session, my wife said, you've been with somebody, haven't you? Wow. I'm like, what? And I, my mind was like, what? And I didn't, I didn't hesitate. I didn't deny it. I said, yes. I said, yes. And she started sobbing. I started sobbing. The therapist started sobbing. And it was that day we said, it's time for us to dissolve our marriage and continue to co-parent our kids. Mm. On that day, I honestly didn't know if I was going to come out of the closet. This could sound 
Um, well, again, I'll just say it this way. This was my absolute truth in that moment. I didn't know if I was going to be gay after having that experiment experience with that man in that bed. But what that told me and what I thought about the entire time I was driving home from San Francisco to San Jose right, or other direction, right way. my wife will never feel that from me the way I felt that from that man. And she deserves that. And she put a ring on her finger expecting that. And I will never be able to give it to her. So, that you're, was, you're, so you're saying that you felt you needed to free her set up her and free. release her. Absolutely. So that she could find what she needs. Yeah, absolutely. Not Ab knowing if you would go that direction. No, because now I have to, now I, that was, up until that point, it was like a, it was an attraction that I never really gave myself permission to experience. And once I experienced it, I knew that this is what I made of. And I still had to reconcile my Christianity. I still had to reconcile my family. I still had to reconcile what does this mean for me? But what it meant for our marriage is that I was preventing her from having what she believed she signed up for. And that I could not do anymore. I didn't care at that moment what it would cost me of other people judging me. I knew she deserved to go get what she thought she had in me. And I, that's what that situation unfolded for me. I couldn't carry that burden anymore. She lived my lie for 15 years and, and we, it was killing both of us. I could not do that to her any longer. That mm. really was what that was about. Which showed that you still loved her or love her. She's the only woman I've ever loved at that level ever, right. okay. ever. I really loved her. And, and where then are you when today we, with her? No, we're really good friends and we're grandparents and we, we talk often and yeah. So from your okay, I quit the church to now my experience with you doing energy work. How'd you get into that? So it was a natural transition from personal training to do massage. And I've just always, the body and body mechanics um, always just seemed like a natural thing for me. Did you go to school for massage? I did. You did, okay. And I, did, I started offering massage before I went to school as another source of income um, while I was figuring out what I was going to do. As a child, I came in seeing energy or seeing colors around people. I didn't know everybody didn't see colors around people. I didn't know there was a name for it. I could see auras. I didn't know everybody didn't under, didn't perceive the information that is embedded in frequency that can be seen with your naked eye if you're tuned to it. I don't know why I came in tuned to it, but I did. So as soon as I started doing massage and I'm seeing people's energy, I started seeing blocks in their energy and I had this intuitive ability, just like releasing knots out of a muscle, I had the ability to release what I saw as knots or blocks in their energy field and watch them shift and change. And people would acknowledge, sometimes there would be an emotional release and we're not even talking. Sometimes... Um, Somebody said something, they would say something like, something just happened. I just feel really weird. Like I feel, uh, I don't know. Different somehow. Yeah. yeah. And so that started to tell me, oh, this is a reciprocal exchange here. And then that was happening simultaneously as I was rebuilding my life as a Christian, coming out as an out gay man, get, really becoming aligned with who I really was and changed my life. And I started attracting gay men who were in similar situations and they would come for massage and then they would just watch me in the community or in similar circles and they would ask questions. How are you doing that? How are you changing your life like that? And I started to notice there was a pattern of what I was telling people I was doing. I'm like, oh, this is pretty systematic. I'm saying this over and over again. So from being an energy intuitive and being able to share information with people about what I saw going on with them, them witnessing me change my life and me notice this pattern. I met somebody who was doing men's retreats and I came on, I went to the, to the retreat, had an amazing experience and it, everything they were doing was already inside of me. <laughs> like, and I, and I knew my first day there, I'm going to be here a while. I don't know why. I didn't even know they asked for volunteers. I didn't know they had a program where they would put people in. So I started to volunteer and I went to this training. 
it was so interesting because normally in the training, you'd have to be an apprentice and then you'd have to be tested. And they just, I went through the training and they put me in. It's mm. like, it just came out of me. Like it had been coming out. The, the, <laughs> the founder of this retreat became one of my massage clients and came for my work. And my work was enhancing his work. And my work on the retreat was enhancing what we were doing with people. And that was enhancing what I was doing with my clients. And then I just started to move into this even more, um, I don't know what I can say, a more enlightened flow of sharing information as it presented. Very much like I do with you now. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how it grew. It just started there. People saying, can you help me? And me finding myself saying, yes, I didn't know how, but. So let's talk about, so you went from Christian pastor to doing energy work. So where is quote unquote Christianity? Where is that right now for you? The way I tell when people ask me if I'm a Christian, I say, I, I, I have a relationship with Jesus as I know him. And I have a very Zen meditative practice. Christianity as church has packaged it is a man-made concept. And so I don't have any relationship to any of that anymore. What I did come to realize, and this is, I put this on my website, seeing energy um, is just connecting with the flow of the Holy Spirit. It, it's just a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. All my intuitive gifts, I was functioning in in the church. They just had different names for it. Nobody challenged me. They actually esteemed me for having spiritual gifts. I would have words of knowledge. I would know things for people and I would share it with them. In that, in the Christian paradigm, that's a word of knowledge. I would have perception that something was moving in a person's life. And I would say this, here's a um, prophecy, like this is about to unfold. That's word of knowledge, prophecy, healing by the laying on of hands. I would lay my hands on people regularly in the church. They would line up in my line with me and my wife because people who came to our line, they would tend to have physical healings. Some would be instantaneously and some would be after the fact, right? So I was functioning in all of the same intuitive gifts in the church with their names and their paradigm, but there's only one energy, one source, one God, one flow of energy. It's just how we choose to package it and then create our life as if that interpretation is the truth. So I just let go of having any labels or definitions and I just let what wants to flow through me flow through me unobstructed with any labels or any restrictions or, or any um, intimidating or limiting thoughts that other people tell me. And that's how I just kind of exploded into this flow of what comes out of me now and the benefits that people and the powerful results people experience. I just said, what if I just do it the way it wants to do it through <laughs> me? <laughs> and what are you doing now? What are, what, what are you involved in right now? Well, COVID kind of changed everything, but prior to COVID, I, I felt this, uh, intuitive leading in 2018, I felt really called to start working with women. And I received this information that was downloaded. I'll, I use that word downloaded. It's just like information comes into my energy field. And I have this awareness to start a retreat program called the goddess mastery experience, which is really energy mastery for women who are in their wounds. From there, I was going to see how I could package that for men. And, and, and that was a really high high touch, um, immersive experience from a Thursday night through a Sunday, much like I used to do with the men in groups. But it Wait, was are only... you talking about you're doing it with men now or women? Which one are you talking about? In 2018 with women. Okay. So this right. goddess mastery experience for women, me and one assistant helping me. Okay. And they went from Thursday to Sunday. Correct. That. Okay. And then from there. So what, what happens there is we really can go deep in understanding energy experiencing blocks, experiencing relief, and then experiencing clarity that comes when those blocks are there. In four days, all of that can happen. And then from there, people can continue to work with me and then find a way to permanently change their life. And that's when I started, once we did the deep dive and could really release blocks, then I could return to the, the pattern and the systems of helping people the way I normally would help them. I was planning on doing that um, for men and then COVID. I had to figure out how do I create that level of trust with people and that level of immediate results to sustain that trust, to keep them 
in a working relationship that would continue to produce results. That's taken a little <laughs> time to figure out how to do that, but I'm starting to figure out how to do that on Zoom. Good news is we're, I think next year I'll be able to, to book retreat centers and I'll be able to return. Mm. And I'm feeling this, I'm feeling like I might even do something for men before the end of this year in the, in a in-person group. And I might even do it for groups a little larger than four, maybe two sets of four and do a group of eight. Okay. All that's percolating. I don't know what's up yet. Well, you of course have to let me know if you're doing of that. Of course. Okay. All right. So as you're looking out, knowing what you know now, what we all this we've talked about, and now you look out at the world, what what's your perception of what's going on right now? Let's speak to that a little bit. So if I was just going to put it in a bottom line nutshell, from my perspective, 2020 was a year to bring us all to a screeching halt metaphorically and literally we were all forced to go inward and that process was to help us as a collective as a species really get honest with ourselves of what's not working in our lives personal lives and what's not working as a species for all of humanity the pandemic everybody's had a different uh, relationship with the pandemic and it's affected everybody's life differently but bottom line that's what 2020 was about 2021 was about it was a choice either in 2020 you received what was being pointed out to you and then you spent 2021 consciously disengaging or, or uh, disassembling that which no longer works for you and kind of moving yourself in the direction, okay, then if this is not working for me, what does? What's calling out to me? And 2022 is about consciously moving into what does work for you and discovering that and following what's new. Your podcast is exactly. a, an amazing example of that, you know? And, and I know you, and I know you came face to face with what wasn't working with you in 2020. In 2021, you started fe feeling into pulling yourself out of that. And then that set the stage for this. From my perspective, 20, the remainder of 2022, and I'll say starting June, we're going to see an energetic shift, shift collectively. Those who did not get the message in 2020, that which is not working for you, continue to have it not work for them in 2022, it's like the rug is going to be pulled out from under us as a collective because there is no more time for you not to admit that which is not working. A prime example on the world stage, Will Smith right. at the, at the um, Oscars, right? It, it wasn't about a joke. It wasn't about the guy on the stage that he slapped. It wasn't about his wife. It was about his unresolved uh, emotions within himself of something that wasn't working between him and his wife that he had not uh, consciously interacted with. So this energy of 2022 set the stage for something to trigger him to come face to face with that which isn't working the down that doesn't make him wrong and it doesn't make anybody who didn't get the message in 2020 wrong it just makes them uh as a species a little down the timeline of this process the entire humans collective is taking ourselves through mm. so 2022 we're going to see more of that we're going to see more reasons for people to have to come to terms we're going to see more governments we're going to see more um, institutions come to terms the whole me too movement and the whole all of that it's a part of what i'm talking about that was all very uh connected to 2020 so as a collective we are coming to terms with what doesn't work for all of us as a species not what works for the elite one percent and the rest of us get the scraps and it's everybody except the one percent who's rattling our own cage to say we got to do it different and you'll see in 2023 2022 is creating more circumstances where we're going to have to face it and then 2023 will be very obvious dismantle of things that no longer serves the entire collect systems that don't work financial systems uh, religious systems 
we're going to start to see them become dismantled and people respond to that dismantle. So that sounds kind of scary or it would it would sound scary to many people. So what's your take on that? Is it a, should be should this be something that's feared or what? Well, the natural response is fear, of course, mm-hmm. because anytime there is change um and anything that rattles our sense of safety makes us feel threatened. But what will begin to happen is the fear will not prevent. Fear doesn't keep us safe. <laughs> um, it, it, it makes us move away from whatever needs to be changed because it feels like it's, it, it feels scary and threatening. But what we will begin to see happen is people will realize, oh, that's happening this is happening this circumstance is dismantling and that my fear can either paralyze me and shut me down or i can begin to interact with my fear differently rather than fear being my foe it can be my friend calling me into the unknown which is the only location i can go to become the next expanded version of myself and only the next expanded version of myself can know how to deal with what the dismantle is presenting. So it doesn't have to be scary at all, but some doors can only be opened from the inside. The external circumstances can create such fear in you that a door is open for you to discover an inner strength and an inner connection to your soul and your own resources in a way that we haven't had access to before now. And lots of people are waking up to that inner guidance. And, and the external circumstances is the gift that's presenting that opportunity. So there's good stuff in all this. There's mostly good stuff in all this. <laughs> okay. Well, this has been great. I think that we're going to do a follow-up if you're open to it at some point, because I want to talk some more about some of these things that we've touched on at the end of this. But uh, if someone's listening to this and their interest is peaked in what you're doing, how do they find you? Uh, MarkHollenstein.com. I have happen to have my website being revamped. A brand new one's going to be um, launched hopefully by June 1st. And how do you spell Hollenstein? Uh, Mark is M-A-R-K. Hollenstein is H-O-L-L-E-N-S-T-E-I-N. And they can contact you through their Absolutely. Through that site if, uh, if they're Ab- interested. Absolutely. All right. Great having you. This was fun. I appreciate you having yeah, me on. It's great. And I made us some dinner, so we're going to have dinner and uh, say goodbye to everybody. Excellent. Thanks, Bye. thanks again, Mark. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.